Welcome to the First Cup Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and today it's 3M Open Storylines, Picks, Sleepers. We've got it all for you. And joining me to break it all down, <laughs> just the two of us, a two-man show. It's Kyle Porter. What up, KP? I know the irony is that with fewer people, because it's us two, we'll probably go twice as long. <laughs> so we uh almost certainly will. <laughs> people people should get locked in for, for this one. Buckle up, get comfy. Uh, yeah, Greg and Mark ditched us, so we're going to roll on without them. And let's jump right it. into this. You hate to see it. Uh, we've got a lot of temperature checks and a lot of unknowns in the field for this week's 3M Open. Essentially, the entire top of like the betting board, all of the favorites have massive question marks. Let's start with Brooks Kepka, who continues to tell us that this knee is like not okay, right? Yeah. And 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 it's it may never be one hundred percent. And I don't know if I really know necessarily what that means. I just feel very concerned. Yeah, I feel very uh, confused. It's almost like he he doesn't like the the well, I don't know who he's working with doctors or physios or whatever. Like they don't really know what's going on or know how to fix it. it it almost felt like and i've kind of picked this up over the last few weeks it seemed like he he thought that the rest that he got during the time off was gonna heal it or like it, that it would be close to 100 percent when he got back and now it's not um did you see his presser on on uh, tuesday no, I have the transcript but i have not read it yet it, it first of all it was like a hostage situation it was <laughs> It was tough. He he did not – I don't think he was, like, fired up to be there, which is – I mean, he's like that at majors, so much less a 3M Open. But he said that on on uh, Sunday – who did he play with on – I think he played with Phil on Sunday, didn't he? Uh, that sounds right. It was a pretty big, pretty big pairing, I think. Yeah, so he played with Phil on Sunday, and he said – he was like, honestly, it felt better on Sunday than it has, I think he said, like, in a really long time or something like that. And it it almost felt like – it almost felt like he was saying it just so people would stop asking him. Um, not that that wasn't true, but it just, it, it had that kind of vibe of like, I'm sick of talking about this. Stop asking me about it. But yeah, the whole thing is, is not great. And I think that, I don't know if people have realized how up and down, like he's not been very good for a year. I mean, you go back to Memphis, he wins it last year, uh, fourth at the tour championship, I think. Yeah. Third. And then, Ever since then, it's been nothing. I mean, he just hadn't – he had that top 10 at, at uh, Harbortown, but I just have – I have no expectations for him. I, I don't know what, what to expect. Next week will be a year since his last win, and yeah. I know we had 91 days off in the middle of that, but that's still kind of crazy to say, and he really hasn't contended anywhere even. I mean, the Tour Championship is one thing. You finished third there. That was a staggered start. But even his seventh at RBC Heritage, it was like he flew up the leaderboard on Sunday. He was never legitimately going to win that golf tournament. So he hasn't even contended in a year, it feels like. Well, and, and it's I, – I feel like people are still doing the thing where they're like, oh, well, we haven't had a major in a year. You know, no coincidence. And it's let's, like – Let's talk about that a second. Go ahead. Finish that thought. I got well, to just about this. I, I don't – that's just, I, I, that doesn't, I, I don't, I don't buy that. Cause you go back to, I think it was last year. I, my years are running together. Did he win? What did he win last year? P, he won PGA last year. PGA and FedEx and WGC FedEx. And he, and he had contended at, he contended at all of them. Cause he was top five in, in all four majors. And I think he finished like second in Honda last year. So it's not like, it's not like he goes to these events and he just does nothing. He, he just, he hadn't won them. Right. And so like he was contending, he was, he was in the mix, not every week, but at various non-majors, he just wasn't winning them. And he would take that game to the majors and end up winning them. So I, I he's not even contending right now. It's not even like he's barely making cuts. So I, I, I feel like that's kind of disingenuous. The, whole thing about Brooks Kepka only caring about majors is the biggest joke that everyone has fallen for. It's a joke. It's a legit this. joke. And, and like it, it lets him off the hook for every other event for the year. Like he shows up at 3M and he goes, 
you know, like let's say finishes uh, T60 this week, we're going to play the, all the hits of, oh, Brooks Kepka doesn't care about this. Well, let me tell you, that only works, Kyle, if you win a bunch of major championships. And I guess it has worked so far, but like that only – less like once you stop winning majors like now you just look silly like i don't understand how we let him get away with this yeah i i did this thing i think i did it last year when him and rory were kind of going back and forth with their little you know brooks's the rear view mirror thing whatever that was yeah. where he was talking about how like I, i've got nobody in front of me when he was world number one and I did this thing then about how, like, okay, this is cute and fun right now, but what about when you haven't won two PGAs in a row? You haven't won two U.S. Opens in a row. How's this going to play? And I feel like we're, we have, we're not there yet broadly. Maybe, like, with our world we are. But I think broadly people are going to be like, wait a second, you haven't won a major in, like, four years, if and when we get there. And, and it's, it's easy. Just, it's easy to not win a major for four years because yeah. there's only four of them and the tour is so deep. Like, this backfires so quickly. Yeah, there, there's, there's a real lack of humility there, which is fine. Like, it's great for us because it's something fun to talk about. But it just – you can't be that good at the majors forever. And at some point, it's going to fall off. And I, I feel like we're starting – like, we're – like, I, I don't think he's going to win one of these next seven majors. And I don't know. Maybe he'll win two of them. Who knows? But I, I just feel like that's where we're at with Kepka, And I, I don't – I mean, it, it – <laughs> Is it that hard to envision him falling into like the 30s or 40s over the next couple of years? No. Yeah. I mean, not with what we've seen in the last year. I mean, I guess when – without winning golf tournaments, I don't know what we have to see from him, right? Because I guess my assumption was always going to be with time off, this knee's going to be fine. And maybe that was his assumption. And, and maybe that's why everyone thought the 91 days off would be good for him and the time off at the end of last year – might be good. Like, I, I don't know where we go from here, right? Like, I don't know what I need to see before I'll, with outside of like a win that I'm like, oh yeah, Brooks Kepka's back. Well, and that's the thing. Like you, you start to look at, and I think about Rory with this, the last, what, 12 years, he hasn't been outside the top 15. And you're like, that's, ins <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. Like yeah. that's, that's a joke. Like how, how, how do you, how, how are you that consistent over that long a period of time? Cause you know, Tiger falls out and Phil falls out and Spieth falls out timestamp, Jacob. Um, all these guys, it's just, it's so hard to remain that good for that long. And Kepka was largely doing it because like just at like only accumulating world ranking points at the majors, right. not only, but like, that was like a, a lot of it. And so I'm really, really intrigued because I think people are, people don't pay it. A lot of golf fans don't pay attention other than the majors. So we're going to go into PGA and us open and people are like, Oh, Kepka. And it's like, you guys been paying attention? Cause this is not going well. And I, I don't, I, I don't, I just don't think you snap it back for, you know, a week in August and a week in September. It, he, the way the official world rankings work, uh, like he's going to have three wins fall off of his counting events, like very soon. Yeah. And I have a, and I'm not the, uh, you know, the OWGR calculator guy, but like, I don't think it's going to be pretty if he can't replace those with a couple other, you know, ones on the, on the results list. Like it's, it's going to get ugly. Speaking of OWGR historic day to, uh, yesterday, Rick, uh, for the first time in six or seven years, Ricky Fowler's not the highest ranked Oklahoma state player in the world. Oh, do you keep a track of that? Like, did you have like that set no. or like you're just doing it unofficially? Like how, I, how did I was looking for uh, Harris English's world ranking and I stumbled into it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens all the time though. Right. It's like, wait, this can't be true. Let me go deeper. Wow. Uh, yeah, Victor, so, Victor got him. So, okay. Yeah, so Hovland's 31 and Fowler's 32. Yeah. I think the last time it was true was um, Hunter Mayhem. Probably. That's probably right. Oh, wow. I was pulling something up on my phone. I can't remember. Oh, okay. So I don't know if I should reveal this. You, you have a, a very important day. I have a very important day that's coming up on Thursday. And I don't know if I should reveal it or I should just tweet it out on Thursday, but I kind of want to, I kind of want to be with you when it happens. Um, Thursday, Kyle is the official three-year anniversary of Jordan Spieth's last victory. Oh gosh. Three years. Think about that. Like, I know it's like, I know we've been saying it a lot, but it's actually Thursday. I had it, I've had it in my calendar for like six months. What is that, July 23rd? Third. Yeah. 
July 23rd was Sunday of the 2017 Open Championship. When he let Matt Kuchar eat grape nuts out of the claret jug. That's the one. <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's crazy too, but I'll- It is uh, crazy. Maybe, maybe my favorite major of the last five years, the, it, which is a little unfair because I'm really basing it on the last three hours of that event, but it was- uh, It was so good. Chaos. It was absolute chaos. It was so fun. I love it. I'm trying to think when was I, I loved the Stenson Mickelson one, but that might not have been in the last. What, what year was that? No, that what was uh, uh, 16, okay. right? Troon was 16. That had to be 16. All right, there, so there's, counts. there's been all the opens have been just awesome. Just I so just, good. I just love seeing that like JB Holmes was third, like 1,000 shots back of everyone else. <laughs> like it was unbelievable. <laughs> I, think Ter- uh, I think Terrell Haddon was a top five at that one. I bet he was. He's the man. That was the beef one. That was that was. A Hell good one yeah, too. that was a good one. Yeah. Um, here's another guy I've got a lot of concerns about. Although I did not miss this presser today from one Dustin Johnson. Although if you weren't paying attention, you would have missed it, Kyle, because it lasted nine minutes and nineteen seconds. <laughs> It was like the shortest presser I think I've ever seen. Like I walked away to get coffee and it was over when I came back. I was like, what the, how did this even happen? Um, I, again, another guy who literally wins the travelers and then goes 80, 80 at Memorial. Uh, Like what? I know he doesn't care. I know he doesn't have a memory of it. He didn't really seem to care in his presser, but like, that's kind of nuts. It's insane. And you were on this on, uh, by the way, nine minutes is about how long his contention at Memorial lasted. <laughs> That's like one and a half shots. <laughs> um, you were on this on Monday talking about, uh, Justin Ray tweeted out this great stat about how DJ's won, I think it was three times uh, right after he missed a cut. So yeah. three of his wins, which is, a, which is kind of a career for a lot of guys, yeah. uh, came in the tournament after he missed a cut. And you said something about how he has the shortest memory in golf. And uh, our, our guy, uh, oh, who, who was the one that re- – It was Epat, right? Eric Patterson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Eric Patterson. Uh, he said, are we sure he has memories? Which I thought was <laughs> just inc- – I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's funnier because it's DJ. And uh, I, I – I don't like, I don't even know if we can take anything away from last week because I don't think he takes anything away from it. So you look at the last two times out, he beats everybody in the field at travelers. He loses to everybody in the field, except for David Lingmurth, I think yeah. at Memorial. And you're like, I have no idea what to do with either of those things. And I think there's a world in which neither of them even applies because he's just, it's just a reset button every week for DJ. Well, you kind of mentioned this, I think, earlier at some point where you said it almost looks like the win was the outlier because Mm -hmm. he's a a similar guy where he hasn't been good, uh, but he's got the win that Brooks doesn't have. But when you look at the larger body of work, the win is the outlier. And I was like, wow, that's deep and also kind of right. Yeah, he did contend at um, Saudi Arabia, I think. Yeah. At the beginning of the year. Second, he finished. And he had a couple of like sort of in the mix, maybe Pebble. There, there were a couple in that like West Coast swing that he was, I don't know, like acting like he was going to kind of get involved, but he never really did. But yeah, I, I just, you look at it since, since the PGA last year when him and Kepka finished one, or Kepka and him finished one, two. That's what, 15, 16 months? He hasn't been good. And I, I don't know if people have fully noticed that because I think sometimes you, you just get these names and people are like, oh, DJ. And it's like, well, have, have you watched the last year and a half? Because it, it has not been, you know, same with Kepka. Like, it's not been good. Uh, he hasn't played well. But I, I, I do, like, it's sort of hard, again, like with DJ, because you're like, do trends mean anything? Like, it, does it, like, with other guys, you're like, yes, this means something. He's hitting the ball well. He's putting poor, what, whatever. But with DJ, you're like, I, I don't know if any of this means anything. Like, it's almost like he just exists outside of all of it. Yeah, he's unfazed about literally anything. I, I tweeted this out, but I just, and it means absolutely nothing, but I love it. So Dustin Johnson, back-to-back rounds of 80. So two, two rounds of 80 in his last two rounds. Rory McIlroy uh, has played 740 rounds of golf since his last two scores of 80 so one was obviously 2011 round four of but the I, know, I, know, 
I know the other one. Okay. Uh, 2010, second round, St. Andrews. Yeah. 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 He went 63-80. No, and he has one. Yeah, I know. He has one more recently than that. He has oh, one he? at um, – yeah, it's at another major though. They're all they're all it was like the US Open, but yes, that's his third one. So he has another one that I'd have to pull up. But yeah, but that's basically Rory goes 740 rounds, has two yeah. rounds rounds of 80. DJ and DJ goes back to back. <laughs> <laughs> what did what did Rory shoot? Was Port Rush 79? Yeah, it was 79. Okay. Uh, the 80 might have been at uh, uh where was that? Not Shin was it Shinnecock? I'm gonna find out for you. It'll take me a minute though. Because it took me like forever to go through. I went through all of his rounds to find it. Not Chambers Bay, not Pinehurst. Uh, it might have been Shinnecock or Oakmont. Might have been say, Oakmont. I want to say it was in 20. So here we go. 20. Let's go 15 ish. Is this good radio, Jacob? <laughs> yeah. Dead, nothing like dead air, me clicking through the PGA Tours <laughs> website that everybody loves. Uh, I don't know. I'll find out for you. We'll, we'll come this back is- to that. This is every listener right now. Freaking first cut. <laughs> Golly. That's good. That's good use of your, of your soundboard there, Jacob. Yeah, congrats on the new soundboard, Jacob. Um, I'll, I'll find it. Uh, let's talk about Tommy Fleetwood because he's back in action this week uh, and apparently playing well because a scorecard has emerged. I love a good scorecard emerging uh, from Shinnecock where Tommy Fleetwood shoots a 64 and there are a lot of threes on that card KP. So this is kind of like we're back at colonial where we have to decide how a 91 day layoff treats these guys. But for Tommy Fleetwood, it's like a hundred and something days. Yeah. I think I'm more impressed by his caddy shooting. What did his caddy shoot? 73. 73? That's a good score. That's dirty. That's really good. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, um, I don't know what to make about Tommy because I think you could argue Dece- uh, November, December, January, February, it was like him, Rory, and, and John Rahm as, as the three guys where you're like, these are the best three guys in the world based on how they're playing right now. He won in November. He had all these like seconds, thirds, uh, fourths, like all these top five finishes. And then he misses the cut at, uh, at Bay Hill. Bad. It was a bad miss cut. Yeah. And then he shoots 78 in the first round of the players. And so not that, the, it's probably meaningless because it was so long ago, but he was definitely trending the wrong way. Um, I don't know. Like the thing I go back to with Fleetwood, I just want him to be good. Like I just love, I freaking love watching him play golf. It's so fun. Like his little like three quarter swing where he's choked up on it and kind of held off at the, like, it's just, I, I love watching him shape the golf ball. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope he goes out and, and plays well and, and kind of gets it. I would love to see him play great at, at Wingfoot. I think that would be just tremendous. Like see him and JT or Rory or somebody just kind of going at it on a Sunday. I think that'd be awesome. I mean, Tommy Fleetwood kind of should have won Honda. Yeah. Right. I mean, he's, he's literally in the middle of the fairway on 18, the 72nd hole hits it in the water. He, t- he makes a bogey. Now, now, I mean, PJ National is unbelievably difficult. Makes a bogey there and finishes two shots behind Sung Jay, who ends up going out to to get the win. So like uh, that, Tommy Fleetwood falls into the category of like guys who need to win on the PGA Tour. Yeah. Uh, who needs Who needs to do that more, him or Fino? Ooh, um, I think it's still Fino because Fleetwood is at least like I, I don't know Fleetwood gets the accomplishments of like Ryder cup. He gets like the Euro stuff. He plays like, I feel like I, I, without looking it up, I feel like he's got more top five finishes in majors or something like that. Like, I don't know how we can quantify that, but Finau feels like he needs it more. Like I still think Tommy fleet was an unbelievable player, whether he wins on the PGA tour or not. Yeah, I think that's right. I heard this, there was an interesting part uh, on the Shotgun Start podcast the other day, Brennan Porath and Andy Johnson, shout out to those guys, good friends, great podcast. And they were talking about how Finau has, they think, more talent than somebody like Fowler. And I was like, ah, wait a second here. Like, Fowler's been pretty good. I know it's it's easy to make fun of like, the, oh, he's greeting the winner and, you know, that whole deal. <laughs> but I just feel like, you you um and I don't know why I'm talking about Ricky Fowler right now, but 
I, I think I, I guess because I, I sort of put Fleetwood, Finau, Fowler, like in, all, all these guys, all the yeah. all the guys whose last names start with F, in this little bucket, this category of like, okay, haven't won a major, don't win maybe as much as you think they should. Although Fowler's won like five times, I think, on the PGA Tour. Yeah. Um. So I, I don't know. It's they're they're so interesting to talk about because you could almost argue it both ways. Like, oh well, they don't win as much as you think, but then the other the flip side is like wow, they have a lot of top fives and top tens. So they play really consistent golf at a high level. Maybe they just got unlucky at times. But at some point, you do have to win. I, I think we – I don't think we overvalue winning. I think we undervalue second-place finishes and third-place finishes and fourth – like those are – that's a big deal, like to yeah. do that consistently over time. But I still think winning is – I think winning's a skill. Like I think it matters over a long period of time. I do too. Um, I have that other Rory round for you. So it was 2018 opening round at Shinnecock at the U.S. Okay. So that was one. The other was final round, obviously, at the Masters. He did do it at um, actually his worst. His like three of his four worst rounds ever are open championships. That's the 79 at Port Rush. His worst as a professional, 83 at the 2007 South African Airways Open. Sure. He was like Rory, 18. Yeah, he was a child. Goes out, shoots, opens, opens with an 83. Ugh, not good. <laughs> um, I have something very interesting happening this week, and so do you, and so does everyone. Baseball is back. Opening day, Thursday, the 23rd, the three-year anniversary of Jordan Spieth's last victory is baseball's opening day. You can't write this stuff. Garrett Cole and the Yankees face off against the defending World Series champion Washington Nationals all week long. Scott White, Chris Towers, Adam Azar, and Frank Stample are getting you ready for this 60-game sprint as well as everything you need for your week one matchups. You can find fantasy baseball today on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you like listening to podcasts we're going to do matchups we're going to do expert picks we're going to do best bets and we're going to do it on the other side are you a big fantasy baseball guy by the way i used to be yeah me too i used to be deep it wasn't good so i obviously we love the numbers baseball is the perfect numbers game oh i know i know it's perfect I, my, I actually would prefer to play this year because it's only 60 games. My issue was a, that's a grind, like 162 yeah. where you got to make your, I, I liked the leagues that you could almost set your lineup for like the whole week and not have to forget about or not have to worry about it. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to check to see who was in the starting lineup every single day. Yeah. I no, I, I totally agree. But I, I mean, there was a point where I, I knew like, every player in the on every roster and yeah like, like when you know the backup catcher for this, like the san diego padres like you're in deep my friends is this how i want to spend my life or should i be doing something else <laughs> yeah now you now you just do it with strokes gained like what like now you know 300 golfers so. i was doing that for fun though at least i'm at least this is like like you know job it's great uh Maybe I'll play fantasy baseball this year. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> You're talking yourself into it. <laughs> I mean, 60 games. I also like the idea of like, there's going to be a lot of different strat. Like no one knows the strategy for 60 games. I like that. Yeah. And you, and you run into like, probably, I don't, I mean, people who are deeper into it would know this better, but some sample size stuff that like yeah. just doesn't, I don't know. It's going to, it's going to be like weird. It's going to be an outlier. So we, we, sorry, producer Jacob, uh, there might be a guy like who hits 400 this year because they, they get scorching hot for like, like Joey yeah. Votto hit 400 on the, in the second half of the season a couple of years ago. Like what, if someone hits 400, I guess it just has a big asterisk next to it. Can you, can you, it's like John Rom's chip in on 16. There uh, you go. The bogey can, of all time. Can, can, we both played baseball beyond, you know, nine years old. Uh, can you imagine hitting 400 in, in the show, in the majors? No. It's that, insane. I couldn't even fit, hit 400 on, like, JV. The, <laughs> the, the, like, line drive rate, like, if you hit a line drive every time you come up, I'm pretty sure, like, that's not even uh, – maybe it is, but, like, like, ground balls are, like, you'd bat, like, 333 or something like that if you hit a ground yeah. ball every single yeah. time. The fact that you'd have to do even better than that, like, I, I don't know. It just – it does not compute going two for five every night. It's, it's insane. It's so crazy. Anyway, we got to talk about DJ and Kepka. Fine. 
<laughs> if we must. DJ and Brooks Kepka is our first matchup. I'll spoil this. Greg took DJ. I've already got his picks. Um, I don't trust either of these guys, KP. I'll make you no, go first. I, I don't either. I I think I'm going DJ just because of the reason for the reason we talked about earlier. I, I don't I don't think trends apply really necessarily. <laughs> I guess. I, I don't I don't I would not want to bet this. I would not want to put any kind of money on this. Yeah, this is certainly not one that I would touch. Um, God, I hate this. I'll take DJ too. I, I really, I usually like to be the guy who takes the the one that you guys didn't take. So I could take Brooks and try to make up a pick here, but I just really don't trust him. At least I've seen Dustin Johnson win recently. Yeah. Tommy Finau. Oh, wow. Tony Finau, minus 120 versus Tommy Fleetwood. A couple of TFs on the matchup here uh greg has already gone with tommy fleetwood i think tommy fleetwood's a kind of a trappy play this week. yeah i do too i'm going Finau. i i i mean look like was the weekend good no it was not good but he still finished eighth last week he was you know he, he got carried a little by the putter especially on day one at muirfield village but it, he he still shot 286 at basically a major championship course so i i don't think that I don't think he's one to just get buried by the frustration of the weekend. I, I think I think he's really sharp. He's a great scorer. I think he's going to beat Tommy Fleetwood. What you described, I think, is a like kind of like this this recency bias thing that we do, where if Finau shot his Sunday round on Thursday yeah. and then climbed his way up the leaderboard to finish T eight, we'd be thrilled and he'd be the most popular fantasy option of the week. Mm -hmm. But because he was at 12 under halfway through Saturday and fades back. Now he's like toxic, which I don't. But it's, but it, you can explain it away, right? Like he's in the lead. So that's why he started playing poorly. Yeah. Like I, it, I agree. There's an explanation for it to where you're like, no, he's playing great golf. Like he's striking it really well. And yeah, I think that translates. Bubba Watson minus 120 versus Sam Burns minus 105. Um, I'll go first here. I'll, I'll, I'm taking Bubba. Uh, I'm actually, and I'm not a Bubba guy. I, I don't like play Bubba in fantasy. I don't bet him a lot, but if there was ever a week to do it, this feels like the week. He was third in strokes gained approach last week behind only EVR and Ryan Palmer. Uh, he cannot putt or chip to save his life, but I don't think he's going to get in a lot of those awkward scenario. Like this is as straightforward as it gets on the PGA tour at TPC twin cities. Yeah. I'll go Bubba as well. Uh, he's hitting it pretty well. I, I don't know what were his finish. I haven't seen his finishes before Memorial, uh, but I, I feel like he had a couple that he always pops at travelers, I guess, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm pulling up his here. I have so it. He was, oh, he had three missed cuts in a row. Yeah. Yeah. I actually missed the cut at travelers. Oh, I was, I was thinking of uh, he had the T seven at uh, colonial. Yeah. That feels, it feels more recent than that, but that was the first, yeah. First event back. He missed a couple of cuts in the middle and finished 32nd despite gaining a billion strokes in ball striking, which is how bad his short game was last week. I'll still pick him. I don't, yeah. I, yeah. He hit it. I just, I, I'll, I, and I was doing this earlier when I was kind of going through some of, some of, the, some of the guys in this field. I, I think I'm putting too much emphasis on what happened last week because, again, it was a major light course. And if you're gaining strokes on approach or from tee to green at Muirfield Village last week, that means you are hitting the hell out of it. Like you are, I mean, you're really feeling your swing and we'll get to that with my pick here in a minute. But so maybe I'm overemphasizing that, but I, I do think that matters. I think it does too. Defending champion, Matthew Wolf minus minus one twenty five versus Russell Henley. Even Greg took Russell Henley. Greg also took Sam Burns in the previous one, by the way. Um, I, this is weird because I really like Matt Wolf this week in general. Uh, mm -hmm. I, the only knock I have against him is the whole fact that he now has to defend for the first time in his career. And yeah. I don't know how guys react to that. But if that's my only issue with him, then I should probably just take him. Yeah. So you're taking Wolf? I'll take Wolf. Okay. Um, I'm going Henley. And the, the reason I, I was looking at his numbers earlier. So data golf has a, a, a bunch of really good. Um, you can just kind of compare previous years and he's having the second worst putting year of his career. Wow. He's hit, he's hitting it really well. I mean, and, and some of that's a little concerning cause you're like, I don't know if Russell Henley can sustain this level of, of strokes gain you know, <laughs> from T to green, but I, I just, I think the putting turned, I mean, he's had positive strokes gain putting years in what six of the last 
seven years and he's negative this year. So that's the part where I, I, I think that turns around at some point. He's been, so his last two events, I will say this, Workday Charity Open and Travelers, he's been lights out with his irons. Like mm-hmm. lights yeah. out from yeah. T to green too. Um, Got to figure out that putter. But if he does, watch out. Yep. Paul Casey minus 125 versus Eric Fun Royan. I don't know. I have to check my pronunciation. Well, you're not going to get any complaints. And Mark might phone in. He might call the he might call the rules hotline, but no complaints from me. I, I'm taking EVR. EVR is the 43rd ranked player in the world. He's so good. Yeah. I, okay. I, I love EVR this week, but spoiler alert, I'm going to have to take Paul Casey. Um, but, but EVR is, first of all, sneaky long. He's like 14th in driving distance and like 190th in accuracy. Uh, don't worry about that, EVR. Don't worry about it this week. Go bomb no. wherever you want. Yeah. Like, I, I, it doesn't matter. There, the rough does not exist. Hope you get that invite to the Hero World Challenge. You can, you can win that thing. Ooh, be great. Oh, he, would, he would shred. <laughs> uh, my Paul Casey take is essentially that he was one under through 35 holes and played one hole five over last week and missed the cup by one stroke. What did he, which, what did, did he make a nine or something? Took an eight. He took an eight on a par three. He took an eight on 12 uh, on Friday. Where was the pin on Friday? I don't know, but he hit it in the back bunker oh. and then hit it from the back bunker over the green, over the little body of water on the other side, actually stayed dry. Then his next shot, he hit in Wait, the he, water. He hit it over <laughs> the water on the other side? On the other side. Then his third shot was in the water. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, did you see on Sunday, uh, Patty Reed made a, made a three from that back bunker? No, oh. I did not. It was a joke because that was the pin that was uh, – uh, middle right or front right yeah and so you're hitting it back toward the water and if you go long it's like it's in and he hit it in that back bunker he's dead i mean you're you're gonna make like at best a four and he ran it past the hole makes the putt coming back it was unbelievable we, we i don't think we ever got a chance to talk about this anywhere because uh, but that um the weather delay he was he was five under through 14 i think through 14 hit his tee shot on 15 marked it there they had the weather delay he came back immediately went bogey double bogey bogey still had a great round but it was like he was way under par i mean he was deep he was holding his breath and i feel like that that break killed his killed his everything yeah it did uh lucas glover who has been low-key one of the most consistently good players uh since the restart versus Luke List, who won on the Corn Ferry Tour a couple of weeks ago, and then also I think finished T ten last week. KP, who you got? Well, this is this one's interesting. I I almost I want to get your take on this. I almost feel like List has a higher ceiling, but Glover's floor is higher. Uh, so I I don't really know what to do with it. I I've really liked Glover's game since the since the restart. I mean, he's just a he's been a top twenty five machine. He's got like five or six of them since the PGA Tour came back. So I'll, I'll stick with Glover, but. I would, I would, I'm concerned betting against Luke Liz. I think that's fair. So if you're betting a matchup, you probably want the guy with the higher floor, which is likely Lucas Glover. I think he finished in the thirties last week and that was his worst finish yeah. since we've been back. Uh, yeah. So I'm actually looking this up. Yeah. So uh, you can just run, this is really nerdy, but you can just take all the strokes gain numbers and run a couple of standard deviations in either direction and see what guys like floors and ceilings are. And yeah. Luke Liz does have, a higher ceiling and a significantly lower floor yeah, than yeah. Lucas Glover does. <laughs> it's not even close. Um, I'll take Glover as well. Cause I think that's the strategy that you should take in head to heads. Uh, Doc Redman versus Ryan Moore. Uh, Greg took Doc Redman. I will also take Doc Redman. I-, I think this is like him playing the three M open or the rocket mortgage classic is a much better situation than him playing like, Mirfield Village and the Memorial, in my opinion. And um, he hit the ball well last week, but was absolutely brutal on and around the greens. I'll take, I'll take the doc. The doctor. He's been good. I, you know, when he was at Clemson, I remember watching that USAM. He won at Riviera over Doug Gim. And you look at – you, I don't know. I kind of followed his amateur career a little bit, and he just did, – it didn't seem like he was a the, – the guys that you're like, okay, this guy's going to be – really good on the PGA Tour are the, are the ball strikers, right? The Victor Hovland type, you know, somebody like that. He never really struck me as that, but he's, he's, he's kind of quietly put together a good last few years, right? Like, yeah. I, I mean, he, he obviously he really popped it at, at Rocket Mortgage last year, but 
he's been steady. He's been consistent. Um, again, he's another guy who I think is, I'll have to look it up, but I don't think he's putting it very well. And I think he, he did last year. Um, so who knows? That's only a one year. I mean, you don't want to take too much just off of one year. So last year he gained 0.17 strokes putting this year. He's losing 0.15. But his tee to green game has been mm-hmm. just phenomenal. I mean, he's been really, really consistent tee to green. So I like him this week. Since the start of the season, so since the start of this year, there's been two events he has not gained strokes tee to green. Like he's he's a very good ball striker. Now, mm-hmm. unfortunately, uh, I think there's only been two events that he's gained strokes around the green. His short game <laughs> needs some needs some work. Uh, but that's yeah, that's he'll, he'll figure that out. More more reps on tour, he'll figure yep. it out. I agree. Uh, that's all of them. Okay. How about this? We're going to, we're going to turn this props game into a little bit of a first round leader because you can win $1,000 this week without putting any of your own money at stake. Just go to cbssportscom slash golf props to play. There will be a full tournament game and we'll have a Sunday round showdown, both with $1,000 hairs on the line. Check out the link in the description. Easy peasy. That's not my words. Easy peasy. This is one of the questions from the tournament long game. And we're treating this as a first round leader because the question is which golfer will have the lowest score in the first round? I don't know. Do you know, do you know who's leading the tour in in round one scoring average? Uh, hold on. So I could probably guess this. Um, wait. Okay. So you're looking at round one scoring average. Yeah. Okay, so it's a, I'm. It's it's a big. Is it a big name? Yeah. Is it Justin Thomas? No, Rory. Ah, Rory. Sixty-seven point eight seems. Yeah, good. that makes sense. There are some guys that are like, uh, way way better on Thursday than they are other. Like so, like um, Keegan Spieth. Bradley always comes to mind. Yeah, Spieth. Um, I feel like Kucher is always near the top of the list in round one. <laughs> uh, Joel Damon's always better in round one. Like these are like random guys that. Out, at least outperform their baseline. I don't know what their actual scoring average is. Uh, if you look at the bottom, it's uh, <laughs> Dustin Johnson T two hundred four in uh, round one scoring average. That's not, <laughs> not great. Eric Van Royen, Vent, whatever. Uh, EVR. T, T, yeah, EVR T two hundred four with DJ. So um, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm going to go with my winner this week. Spoiler, I'm going Harris English. I wish the tee times were out. I always like the guys that have the early Thursday tee time. Yeah. And then I go and, and load up on, on those guys. So um, if you were, if you were pl- like, if, like, let's say you're on tour starting tomorrow for the rest of your career. Great. And you can, you, <laughs> we probably wouldn't do this podcast anymore. No, I would never talk to you again. <laughs> uh just yeah just send me a couple of you know like some of your some of your scripting and yeah be good um would you choose like and somebody said you can choose uh early late or late early but you have to do that for the rest of your career you have Mm -hmm. to you have to start early late or late early rest of your career what would you pick Hmm. i think it you have to go early late because you get the purest form of the golf course Thursday morning. You get the long rest where you get to sleep in on Friday. And then if you're playing well, you get essentially three late starts in a row, which I think is what you want. Yes. That's, the, that's the only answer. Right? I yeah. I, I, late early would be – I mean, you, you, you go out and shoot 66 in round one, and you got to bounce back in, like, 10 hours. Yeah. And then, then if you're leading, you've got, like, you know, forever until you and, – and you're more, like, wound up during that. It, it has to be early late. I think it has to be early late as well. Um, I'm actually going to take EVR as my first-round leader. So I'm looking wow. at his strokes gained. Uh, round one strokes gained – Positive 1.05. That is uh, better than his baseline. And he gets worse every single day as we go along. So I'll take EVR to be my first round leader. Expert picks. Let's do our sleeper. And I'll tell you, Greg's is Richie Wierenski, and he is not here to defend himself for that. So I have no idea why he picked 
Richie Wierenski, but he's 80 to one. So at the real GFD to find out what's going on. There. That's uh, yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to hear an explanation there. <laughs> I've got, I've got doc. We talked about why earlier uh, he's 50 to one. I think that's a pretty good, I mean, look, this isn't a great field. It's, you know, it's a little bit, you, you were on him going into uh, to Detroit a couple weeks ago and sa- same type deal. It's like, okay, it's not a great field. He's somebody who I think is playing better than his name and his betting number would indicate. Uh, I, I, I just, yeah, I like him at 50 to one. I think that's good for him. I love it. I went, uh, I went with burned Viesberger, who is ranked 29th in the world. I know. How many people crazy? do you think know that? Zero. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> he got up to, I think he was at like 23 at one point. Well, he was awesome last year. He, yeah. He was he really won good. Three times in 2019. I think he won two or three of the uh, the Rolex series events on the European tour. He I won like right. Italian Open and yep. fr- French Open. And- so my case for Burned this week, now he missed the cut at the Memorial last week, but my case here is essentially a lot to do with the field. So he's like never come over and played anything besides like a WGC, a major, or – uh, or the Memorial. Like the Memorial was like the first like regular event he's played in like that I could find. Yeah. This is going to be by far the weakest PGA tour event he's ever played in. And he's like a legit winning. Uh, like, I don't care what tour you're on. It's hard to win golf tournaments. The fact that he did it three times in, in the last, like in 2019 is, is something for a guy who's 80 to one. Well, it's like a, I mean, th- I don't mean this disparagingly. It's like a Euro tour event in terms of field strength, right? Well, uh, didn't you say this was the, the only tournament since the, since the restart that's been uh, a weaker field than it was last year? Do you have the, the, uh, the OWGR number on it? Do you from last year or from this year? Uh, well, it would have one. to be from, well, I can get oh, you. Oh, it hadn't come out yet. It hasn't yeah, come out yet, but I can give you this. Last year's was, uh, I have it right here, 3M, control F. Here we go. Matthew Wolf won it. It was 255 last year, and it's going to be weaker than that this year. Okay, so 255 is akin to – I'm trying to find like a – I'm going like to go to Burned. Yeah. A European tour event that would be – so like Abu Dhabi was uh, 338. So Abu Dhabi is signif- – well, not significantly. It's, it's, it's reasonably better. I got it. Here you go. Italian Open, which Burned Wiesberger won, 248. Yeah, there you go. Boom. It's a European tour event. It's – yeah, it is. And I, I, I like that. Bern Weisberger is the 29th player. I thought he would always be known for being the guy that played in the final round with Rory at Valhalla in 14 and oh. just getting just vaporized when yeah, Rory won his, won his fourth. He was just along for the ride. <laughs> yeah, he was like the best seat in the house. Uh, but he's look, he's, he's had a really good couple-year run. I think if you go back to the Ryder Cup stuff, he's one of the guys that's hurt the most, right? Like, he, he was going to be on the Ryder Cup team. And now, I, I don't know, I haven't seen what they're doing with their points, but hopefully he can still make it next year. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, top 10. So we usually do, like, top 10 locks. So Greg did – Paul Casey. I went deeper for my top 10 lock because I wanted a reason to reiterate this Patrick Rogers stat that I have hanging around here. Uh, so I think Patrick Rogers, you can get him probably six to one to be top 10. So you much deeper than we normally go, but I wanted to run this stat out. Bent grass greens, like we're going to see at TPC twin cities this week, Patrick Rogers gains on average 0.56 strokes. So half a stroke per round on bent grass in his career. It is the 12th best in this field, but the best Kyle Porter of any golfer who has played at least 50 rounds on bent grass. Sign me up, baby. He's got back to back. He's got two top twenties in the restart. Let's go. So I have a, I love, I, this is insanely <laughs> deep, but I have a really hard time in any situation picking guys based on on how they're putting or what they've done putting wise no matter what the stat is how, like how do you how, when you're looking at something like that I just I just naturally gravitate towards guys who are either trending in ball striking have struck it well at a course at this course or a course like this before whatever how, how do you differentiate putting stats that are meaningless versus putting stats that actually mean something when you're picking guys like this? So I actually uh, mostly agree with you. I do not ne- – like the surfaces thing I think is completely overblown a lot of times, uh, especially because we're now we're getting a lot of hybrid mixes and like um, a lot of small sample size issues and things yeah. like that. So I, I don't look at it too much, but every player that I've ever had the opportunity to ask about this, 
talks about the green surfaces all the time. And like, usually it's where they grew up. It's like, Hey, this is, I grew up in Southern California. I'm familiar with, you know, Kakuya around the greens and Poa on the greens or whatever. Right. And I'm comfortable with that. And I can yeah. read the grain better. So as much as I think there's a data issue on it, the players think it's a real thing. So I'm lukewarm to it. Yeah. That's interesting. And I wonder if that's just like a, a talking point where like everybody, all the players talk about it. So then they all keep talking about it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> like that might be it, but no, that that's interesting. That's, that's helpful. Uh, your top 10. Uh, Fino. I just think of the top talent in this field, he's playing the best of anybody. Don't trust Kepka. Don't trust DJ. Don't really trust Fleetwood. Cause I haven't seen him. So I, I'll go with Fino there. Picks to win, 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 win. Greg has chosen Doc Redmond, so clearly there is a lot of Doc Redmond love this week. I've already made my case for Paul Casey, who I think was playing great last week. You can make the argument that not having to deal with the weekend at Mirfield Village might be a benefit. Now he goes to a place where all, he has, all he's got to do is catch a hot putter. I know that might be tough for, for Paul Casey, but um, I like him at 22 to one. And I actually like your guy as well, who you chose to put to win. Yeah, I picked Harris English, 33 to one, quietly having really the best year of his career. I mean, yeah. he's got, uh, so two, uh, he had a really quiet T13 last week. He beats Tiger, he beats Rory, he beats uh, Brooks, he beats DJ by a lot. He beats all these different guys. Uh, finishes T13 at Muirfield Village, T17 at the RBC Heritage. Uh, he's got a bunch of like, you know, top 20s so far this year. I I'm really probably only taking away from since the restart where he has one miscut and then the two top 20s. So I don't know. I, I, he played well here. I think he was top 10 here last year. I might have that wrong. It might have. Oh, Lucas Glover was top 10 here last year. That's what I was thinking of. But I just I, – I, I love English at 33-1. to 1. I think he's more of like a 20 or 25-1 to 1 type guy in this field. Gain strokes in all four of the major strokes gain categories always goes a long way. Uh, best bets. Greg uh, continues the Lucas, Lucas Glover love. That's tough to say. <laughs> he picked him over Luke List as his best bet. I've continued the EVR love in him taking down – fellow South African Dylan Fratelli, who I actually like both of those guys this week, but EVR seems like a perfect fit. KP, your best bet is? I've got uh, Russell Henley over Matthew Wolf. We talked about this one a little bit earlier. The, the Wolf thing's hard because he's really hitting it well, and I, I think he's going to be a little overvalued this week just because he's defending champ, featured groups, all these different things, but I'm picking Henley over Wolf with a a little, little, I'm a little worried about what Wolf could do. <laughs> uh, one of my most interesting things for this week is to see how Matthew Wolf does, how he handles the whole defending thing, if it matters at all. I, I'm that's a very good storyline for me. I like that. Yeah, one. I agree. I agree. All right, give us a follow over on Twitter at First Cut Pod. You can follow Kyle Porter on Twitter at Kyle Porter CBS. You can find me find me on Twitter at Rick Run Good. This has been the First Cut. We'll catch you next time.